not, or while people are maybe preparing their questions, let me, let me ask a question. Um, so one of the, the common themes um, here in the uh, evolution of the, both technology and automotive and the, the Twitter uh, analysis of dynamic networks and, and the emerging health um, uh, applications where you have uh, immediate uh, feedback from sensing and uh, learning uh, analytics, connectivity is critical. Um, and you know, we certainly see that uh, uh, internet speeds, uh, speeds of, of uh, uh, data um, communication are increasing day by day, uh, but at some point they might increase to such a, an extent that they will uh, not allow human intervention in a timely fashion, where you, the, the time scale of the machine is overtaking the time scale of the human. How does, how does one uh, uh, attempt to grapple with that uh, dichotomy? Uh, is, it, is it a danger? Certainly, I can imagine in some uh, you know, life-threatening types of applications like transportation, it could be, uh, when the system goes unstable and takes over, and the, uh, the individual uh, in the automobile has lost their ability to take rapid control because of the fact that just they're not paying attention to the road, as, as one example, but one could, could build other similar examples for the other applications. So connectivity, how important is it? Uh, where is it taking us? And what are the implications uh, when connectivity becomes basically on the order of uh, perhaps in the, in the distant future, nanoseconds as opposed to, uh, to seconds or minutes uh, within the, the human uh, ability to respond and adapt. Mm -hmm. well, certainly for, uh, for learning work, the connectivity is, is key because it, it lowers the barrier substantially to getting data back. Mm -hmm. um, we had a network of campus-based higher education centers who were absolutely collecting assessment data very regularly on paper you know, quizzes, mm -hmm. but it was impossible to analyze centrally, so it's an essential piece. I don't know if they're going to be learning emergencies from too quick a, uh, you know, a, a feedback loop with, mm -hmm. with learning, but what I see actually developing is these hybrid learning systems where people can get dropped into a learning environment as experts at a moment's notice where, okay, the last three ways we've tried to describe adding fractions unlike denominators isn't working. Now you get the Western Massachusetts expert on fractions who has now dropped in and said, mm -hmm. hello, bro, I see you're having trouble, blah, 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 blah. So the speed of that kind of ability is actually, I think, is going to be very helpful, at least in a, in a learning setting. Other settings have a lot more dangers, I think, so it's a fair point. Well, your example, I'm not sure I, I quite get the connectivity piece of this. Certainly the automated driving, um, we've got to think as we introduce those kinds of technologies, um, how do we keep the customer engaged mm -hmm. in the driving process as you're on the learning curve? Any new technology has a learning curve. Um, uh, you know, so the, the connectivity piece of it, I don't know if that drives it directly. Um, you know, I th think if you're going to flip that around, maybe the connectivity is the speed into which you could intervene in an unsafe condition into the vehicle, right, when you have a smart infrastructure. But again, that's but speculation it, more on my part. In the design of the autonomous vehicle, is the, does the human retain any autonomy? Yes, in fact, I think that's the, um, so I don't have any announcements to make, obviously, <laughs> but part of the design of Super Cruise um, requires that the customer stay mm -hmm. engaged with the vehicle so they can be hands off. And the question is, how long can you be hands off in a safe condition, right? And then how do you move that from millisecond, from nothing to milliseconds to seconds to minutes? Yeah. I think it's very much an intrinsic danger that we haven't yet come fully to terms with. I suppose you could argue we've already got precedents in terms of large-scale computerized trading, mm -hmm. flash crashes right. and so forth would be examples of that, and then you translate that into life-threatening situations. Uh, so I, I don't think that many elements of this have yet been fully thought through. So in the kind of work we're doing, um, and analysis of crowdsource data, mm -hmm. Twitter, et cetera, for either disasters or state stability, internet connectivity at the moment is so appallingly low in so many places yeah. 
that we're actually losing data. And if it gets better, it gets faster, then all but that means is you won't lose data. It can't get fast enough. But the more, the stronger issue though has to do with in general machine intelligence. And so there's things like bots out there. And what, as you increase, it's not the connectivity that's faster, it's the machine intelligence mm -hmm. that's faster and better. At the moment, bots can already do, use for most social media, they can out tweet, out Facebook, whatever, human beings, because they can be extremely fast. That, from our perspective, that's great, because it makes them easy to detect. And in fact, you make have to make them stupider to make them look more like humans to make them harder to detect. So right. that's, that, that's kind right. of an interesting feature. But as machine intelligence gets better and they become more able to hide, they will also become more able to detect. So it's not a connectivity thing, it's almost more of a cat and mouse detection mm -hmm. thing. And there I think the key is not the speed, but it's whether we can learn, learn better um, how to harness and understand our ability as humans to reason not about not to be cognitive, but to be socially cognitive. Because what we're seeing is that as people are, people have something that machines don't have, and that is understanding of the connections among people. And that understanding, once you, we can harness that, we'll be better off. Good, thank you. I think there's a few questions now waiting. Let's start uh, with uh, the stage right. So uh, this is uh, for the Kaplan gentleman. Um, you didn't mention in your talk uh, the, the notion of uh, distributed practice, um, which is the, the study that, that there are less time spent in individual sessions, but more sessions spread over a longer time. And I was curious about the notion of uh, how big data and, and the reactivity of systems and monitoring, which I think ties into what you were talking about just a second ago, um, allows for that. And then the other would be um, adaptive learning, where you don't study things you already know Instead, the system detects what it is that you're good at and only asks you about things that you need to practice more of. And yeah. establishing that sort of feedback loop and changing of the behavior of the student as well. But both those things, I think, are linked together. There's, there's a rich array of research on different interventions that work better for different kinds of outcomes, including spaced practice and so forth. Um, interestingly, the point about assessments and using them for adaptive learning, it's very powerful and very efficient. But the risk is, if you make the assessments not be valid probes of the skill you're after, many uh, assessments of things like you know, Boyle's Law or story problems end up actually being reading tests. They're not actually tests of the skill itself. In a normal conventional setting, because reading ability is correlated with learning, you know, everybody does everything and then you take the tests, it kind of works out okay. But if you're going to skip a problem about Boyle's Law, because of a test, if the test is actually a reading test, you've just skipped the instruction in Boyle's Law. You, you don't know Boyle's Law. You're just a great reader, and the test was lousy, right? So to, to be able to you know, get that future of better adaptive assessments and use that efficiently, we really have to up the game on the assessments. And that benefits from the big data work, because then you can much more quickly get data about, well, which of these items are working and not working, and retire them quickly. So it, it does feed together, but there's got to be more care on that front. We'll go to the question on stage left. Um, I have a question on density, which is mostly with the GM person. Uh, your little future, does that work in rural areas that you have the little cars driving around, or you know, how to Density is really important for the network person when right. So when are you talking about video out. in particular? Right, right. Yeah. So, so how so, do you? Right. So um, obviously the video is an envisioning exercise. Um, how that comes about, and that was really driven in urban environment, right, where you do have a lot of density. Mm -hmm. um, how that would translate to a rural environment? You know, I think there are mixed views about what the use case will be there. We don't actually see, um, or at least. I don't see personally um, the individual vehicle ownership model going away um, as we see it. I th see the mix changing, especially as you get into urban environments and you have more of that infrastructure there. Um, you won't have that infrastructure in other places. We'll go uh, to stage right. All right. Hope you forgive me. I had to take notes on what I was going to say exactly. But this is a question for Dr. Post and referring to Dr. Groff's. Um, oh, it's kind of in reference with Dr. Groff's talk and about privacy 
And since when we think about privacy of data, a lot of us think about healthcare. And as we saw from the prior, the news on the Ebola epidemic that came about, and we saw like weekly reporting from the CDC and, and really nice visualizations about where certain danger areas were, it, that's starting to become more and more possible with the data uh, that we're getting now from our citizens in the US. And how would you recommend us, how, how do you envision us going around to be actually utilize these uh, uh, patients' records in real time in order to give some sort of, of an indication of environmental risks for the, popul for the populace? Oh, it's an excellent question. It does come down to this issue of how comprehensive do the data sets have to be. So mm -hmm. as I readily acknowledge, one can put up a theoretical slide as to what we've actually got to capture, and that will not occur simply. It'll probably occur in packets that uh, certain categories of risk will be prioritized that you will actually seek to identify those ahead of others that you view to be a lower probability risk. Uh, there is the issue of scale, and of course, an interesting development today out of Europe is the fact that the, uh, the Europeans have now thrown out under the data directive the fact that you cannot move European data to the US. So that not only has implications for sort of Facebook and Google, it certainly has implications for a number of ongoing large international medical uh, studies. So I think we're going to have to come back to policy issues and uh, reflecting on the very lucid talk we heard at the beginning of this session on entirely new systems that we've got to contemplate. Those have barely been contemplated in the healthcare sector uh, mm -hmm. to date. I mean, we, we, there's a lot of controversy. In, uh, in fact, the fusillade was shot across the bow by the American Society for Clinical Oncology this week that uh, they believe that the organization of electronic medical record vendors is actually becoming a serious obstacle to the actual sharing of data that there are any one of a number of sort of submarine clauses built into contracts and so forth, which actually are handicaps uh, to that. So it's a very complex multi-dimensional issue that we're going to have to think long and hard about uh, how we get to sharing data both nationally and internationally. Interesting. I, if I'm remembering right, there was some information showing that um, looking at Google searches for flu treatments yeah. or sniffle medicines was faster than waiting for the CDC's report. Mm -hmm. So there are these weird, you know, kind of uh, availabilities of rapid maps almost. Is that, does that sound right? Is that... Uh, it's right to the extent, but unfortunately, the Google data was wrong. Ah. <laughs> that, that was the... Uh, but but none, nonetheless, how we mobilize entirely new patterns. There was an interesting paper in the National Academy of Sciences about three or four years ago showing that the average time from the time an, in, uh, an index case occurs in a major communicable disease around the world, it's typically anywhere up to 48 days. And mm. In part, we saw that in Ebola, mm. where the first index case was the 24th of December 2013, mm. and it wasn't until March that it was actually identified. But I think uh, on the positive side, we're seeing much more uh, real-time data mm -hmm. with people just reporting from the beast on the hip mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, real-time data coming in. And I think that even though that particular Google epidemiological exercise was flawed, I think we're seeing much more sort of robust algorithms being brought to bear. And uh, this sort of crowdsourcing of epidemiological data will actually be far faster than the sclerotic bureaucratic mechanisms of CDC and the World <laughs> Health Organization. Interesting. Thank you. Good, we'll take another question from stage left. I was wondering if George anticipates major improvements in clinical trial design using streaming data to accelerate personalized and precision medicine. I think the short answer is yes, but I'm not sure when. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the, there's another subset of that important question, and that is the fact that as we begin to stratify patients into ever smaller cohorts, mm. so if you take something like breast cancer, where we now say there are 10 different types of breast cancer, but we're already finding that there are subtypes of subtypes, how do you actually, what type of clinical trial design do you actually put in place? There are many people who are now arguing mm that the classical randomized clinical trial methodology 
will not stand up and that you've got to move to new types of Bayesian clinical trial design only selecting on the basis of patients so it wouldn't be you know, all comers go into a trial, it'll be subsets of patients who've been stratified molecularly that if your drug acts on target X only, target X positive patients would go into that trial and so forth. So there's a, I think we're going to see a lot of change in clinical trial design and undoubtedly real-time reporting and importantly patient reported outcome data will also become increasingly important. Okay, I think uh, we, we're out of time for questions. I'm sorry. Um, you can talk to the panel after uh, the break or during the break, which we, we're entering in at this point. Um, and let's thank the panels. Uh, you know, the Data Science Institute in London is very similar, uh, really, in some ways to our own. You can see the structures. It's remarkable to see the similarities, really.